praise God. Thank you, Sister Elissa and praise team for your praise and worship. Thank you, Brother Derek, for leading off. I believe Brother Derek's out with youth already, but I have still thanked him. Praise God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Paul writes here, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. There's an equation in, in these verses that we're going to look at tonight. If math wasn't your thing in school, or if math still isn't your thing, don't worry. This is not a complicated equation. But it is one that we need to understand if we're going to live the life that God intended for us, both here on earth and in eternity. My title tonight is Quirky. You all know me. I enjoy quirky titles. It's all going to make sense by the end of the message. My title tonight is Defeating the Dragon of Discontent. Brother Derek has prayed. Thank you, Thank you again, Brother Derek. God bless you all. You may be seated. Paul gives Timothy six very profound and powerful words in our opening scriptures. Godliness with contentment is great gain. It's a simple equation. It's not like algebra, where you have to figure out one or more of the variables. It's, it's straight up, straightforward, one plus one equals two. Or maybe in this case, since God's involved, maybe one plus one equals more. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. How great is great gain? In God's economy, there's no telling. I, 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 I do know that, that 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 tells us that I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. How great is great? Love God and find out. If we want to experience that great gain, however, we need to solve Paul's equation in our lives. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Let's define our variables. Godliness in this verse is the Greek word eusebia, meaning piety or faithfulness toward God. It means devotion. Contentment is the Greek word Okay, it's a Greek word. I'm, 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 I'm just going to say that. I'm not going to try this one. I am bailing out. Contentment is a Greek word meaning self-satisfaction, contentment. Further study turned up this, this definition for contentment. A perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. So all that being said, maybe we can put our equation together like this. Faithfulness and devotion to God plus being satisfied with the condition of your life equals great gain. Now, let me throw this out for everyone to think about. What happens if one of the two parts of the equation is missing? It doesn't work. Let's look at why for a little bit. What does contentment without godliness look like? There are two ways to look at that. Number one, the way the world sees it, and number two, the truth. That's blunt, it's also accurate. The world will tell you that contentment without godliness is a lifelong party. You don't have to worry about a thing. You don't have to worry about what the pastor says. There are no rules, no restrictions. Just be good to everyone and do what you want. Enjoy your life by your rules. Everything goes. Go to that party and live it up. Crack open that bottle and forget your sorrows. Take that girl home and forget about your loneliness. It's all about feeling good. But here's the truth. The party ends and everyone goes home. The bottle is empty and the sorrows come back. The girl leaves and you're back to being lonely. And how does the world recommend you handle that? Go to another party. Have another drink. Introduce yourself to another girl. It's a draining lifestyle. Literally, it sucks the life out of you. It might masquerade as a good time, and a person might be able to lie to themselves for a little bit and think that they're content, 
but a life of contentment without godliness can be defined in three words. I need more. And if needing more is how you define contentment, it's not contentment at all. Contentment without godliness means we are trying to manufacture our peace and happiness on our own. I know from experience how that works. It doesn't. C contentment without godliness means that we're always looking for the next peak. We're always looking for the next high point. And it doesn't even have to be in the partying lifestyle. It doesn't have to be anything sinful. Maybe a nice new truck will make me happy. Maybe a new job or, 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 or a big promotion will help. Some days it doesn't take much. Some days a nice thick slab of cheesecake and a big cup of coffee feels like enough to do the trick. Preach that. Amen. Cheesecake is good. It doesn't take much sometimes. A new book. A new book. A new CD. Yes, I am still old school like that. I do still listen to CDs, and no, I do not read ebooks. I am old school. But, but, but we chase after all these, 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 these little things, big or little, high points, high points. But it's always chasing. It's chasing after more. I don't want the truck I have. I want that truck. I don't like this job. I want that one. I don't care too much for cherry cheesecake, but, but put strawberries on instead, and I'm going to be a happy man. More books. More CDs. More, more, always more. That is not contentment. In fact, that is the very definition of discontentment. At what point does more become enough? When, when you're living like this, it doesn't. When you're living a lifestyle of contentment without godliness, there is no enough. You're always looking for, for a taller mountaintop with a better view. We try to do all of this on our own. The thing of it is, we don't have to. We don't have to figure out how to get to a high point by ourselves. Our lives belong to God. He made us. He's our father. He is the potter. We are the clay. We are all the work of his hands. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Paul writes here, what? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? Which are God's. We are God's. Body and soul, we belong to God. We try to figure things out on our own and make ourselves happy without him. We're going against the very one who made us, who might have a different plan in mind. If we belong to God, he's got to say in where we go, what we do, and, 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 and everything else. And, and, and as much as we, we might want to skip along happily from mountaintop to mountaintop, perfectly content, sometimes God takes us into deep, dark valleys. He takes us off the mountaintop. He takes us out of the sunshine. He takes us down where it's dark and damp and cold. And, 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 and when God takes us to those places, we still need to be content. We still need to trust God with the journey. He made us. He leads us. If, 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 if he wants to take us off the mountaintop and down into the valley, that's his call. We need to trust him. We need to trust him, not try to make ourselves happy. Not, oh, it's, oh, it's, it's dark, it's dark. What, what do I have for light? Oh, cell phone. Here we go. What's on my cell phone? What's going to make me happy on my cell phone? I forgot to turn off my cell phone during church. Fix that. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> we need to trust God no matter where he leads us, friends. We need to be, you know, if, if, if he can't be happy with it, I mean, we might not be, be jumping and dancing and turning cartwheels to be down in the valley, but at the very least, we can say, God, you've got me. God, you've got me. I don't, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why this is happening, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm not going to grumble. I'm not going to complain because you're with me. And that is all I need. 
That's all I need, Lord, is you with me. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Here we read, let your conversation or lifestyle be without covetousness. Stop wanting more. You don't always need more. We get so hung up on that. Let your life be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Friends, what more do we need? What more do we really need to be content with our lives? We belong to God, and he will never leave us. That is all we honestly need to know. Why should we live our lives in this mad rush to, to accumulate things when, when we can't take them with us anyway? We have food. We have clothing. We have shelter. God provides all these things, and God provides more. The Lord is our helper and our strength and our peace. He is literally all that we need to be satisfied with the condition of our lives. He takes care of everything when we rely on him. If we are determined to search for contentment without godliness, we are missing out on everything God has to offer. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Paul writes, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, which means brought low, humbled, or humiliated. And I know how to abound, to be over and above, to exceed the ordinary. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. In verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We can be content no matter what's happening in our lives because God is our strength. He's going to teach us how to be content at, in, in, in the high times. He's going to teach us how to be content in the low times. He's going to teach us how to be content in the valley. He'll teach us how to be content in the mountaintop. He'll teach us to be content in the summer rain. He'll teach us to be content in the flood. If we will just trust him, if we will just be willing to learn of him and content ourselves in him, we'll be blessed. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Let's flip the script now. We've talked for a while about contentment without godliness. What does godliness without contentment look like? Godliness without contentment is having everything lined up, line upon line, precept upon precept, following all the rules, and not having your heart in it. It might look like this. Oh, six o'clock. I need to get out of bed and pray. I'll pray for an hour, but I won't have breakfast afterward because I have to fast today. Instead of eating, I suppose I should read my Bible. I'll memorize the first three chapters of First Chronicles. I'll finish up. Somebody got that. I'll finish up just in time to go to work and show everyone how much I love the Lord. You know what? If, 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 if you're going to come to work and show me your love for the Lord like that, don't. Just don't. It's depressing. Of course, I, I, I've exaggerated everything here. But there is a very real danger of slipping into this kind of an attitude. Notice the words I chose for that illustration. I need to. I have to. I suppose I should. That's not love for God. That's a sense of duty. There's a big difference. If there's no real love in a relationship, 
if we're just going through the motions because we have to, we're not content. We're not satisfied with the condition of our lives. We can look Christian, dress Christian, talk Christian, maybe even convince ourselves that we're thinking Christian. But if we're not finding joy in the Lord, if we're not delighting ourselves in him, if he's not recognized as the ultimate source of our happiness, we are missing the mark. Malachi chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. This is God speaking. And God's not happy. He says, beginning in verse 11, For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, in that ye say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it. And ye have, and, 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 and ye have snuffed at it. This is literally scornful sniff, like... <clears throat> Ye have snuffed at it, saith the, Lord, saith the Lord of hosts. And he brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus he brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? We'll stop there. Here the Lord is calling out the priests in the temple. The spiritual leaders, the ones who are supposed to have everything all together. They were having church. They were doing everything they were supposed to do. They were filling their duties but they missed out on the love. Without love, duty gets tiresome. Well, it's another day of work at the temple. Yay me. Without love, duty looks to cut corners. God doesn't need my very best. This is good enough. Without love, resentment grows. I'm so tired of offering the same old stupid sacrifices over and over and over. This is the attitude that got into the priest's heart. The priests had the knowledge, they had the ministry, but they did not have the love. Without love for God, they were not content to live for him. They weren't satisfied with the condition of their lives. It was all misery to them. It was all drudgery. And instead of great gain, they earned the rebuke of the Lord. What else, do, what else does godliness without contentment look like? It can look like this. God, I'm following you, but you're not blessing me the way I want you the, 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 the way I want you to. We'll follow God, but we but 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 we want to be on our terms. We want God to move when we ask him to. We want blessings and miracles and provision on our schedule. And when God doesn't line up with our expectations and do exactly what we want, what happens? We grumble and we complain. We're not satisfied with the condition of our lives, and we let God hear about it. The perfect scriptural example of this, of course, is the children of Israel as God was leading them through the wilderness to the promised land. They crossed the Red Sea on dry land. They saw the destruction of Pharaoh and his army in Exodus chapter 14. In Exodus chapter 15, they sang a song of praise. But literally two verses after that song ended, they started complaining. There's no good water here. We're all going to die. Despite their complaint, God provides. In Exodus chapter 16, Israel grumbles again. There's no decent food out here. We should have just died in Egypt where all the good food was. Again, God provides. In Exodus chapter 17, Israel again finds no water on their journey. What happens? Moses, give us water. Why'd you bring us out here to die? God tells Moses to strike a rock with a staff. Moses does so, and water comes forth. Once again, God provides. Those are just a few examples, but it goes on, and on, and on. Parents, you, you know how this is, don't you? You've probably dealt with your children when they've been in moods like that. Yeah, 
Everything is terrible. Yeah. And pretty quick, we were like, okay, Junior, you keep it up. I'm going to give you something to whine about. Which is pretty much what God did. Numbers chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. God says here, because all these men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened unto my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. So stop there. I can imagine just a bit of exasperation on God's part here. Ten times, kids. Ten times we've been through this. You complain, and I provide. You complain, and I provide. You complain, I provide some more. And now you're right here. Right at the edge of the land I promised you, you're ready to walk in, and you're complaining. Again. You're doubting. Again. After everything you've seen me do, you're still not satisfied that I'll take care of you. And God turned Israel away from the promised land for the next 40 years until all the grumblers, complainers, and doubters died in the wilderness. Now, some might hear that and think it's a little bit harsh. Some might think it's easy to justify Israel's complaining. After all, they were in the wilderness and they were thirsty. They were hungry. They were intimidated by the, the, the report of giants in a promised land, and maybe that sounds reasonable. I mean, I don't want to fight a giant. I, I'm, I'm, I'm little. <laughs> but again, but again, how much had Israel already seen God do? Their, their, their deliverance from Israel was a whole series of miracles. I said, uh, I, I, I said deliverance from Israel, didn't I? Deliverance from Egypt. There's a whole series of miracles. The ten plagues, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, parting the Red Sea and walking across on dry land, watching Pharaoh's army drown. Miracle after miracle after miracle right there. And, and, and every time after that in their journeys, every time they grumbled and made their, their, their dissatisfaction known in the wilderness, God helped them. Nine previous occasions, God helped them. But here on the 10th, God has had enough. Godliness without contentment shows a lack of faith. Sure, Israel was being faithful and following God. They were going through the motions, but they didn't show that they trusted him to keep his word. The God who made them and had promised to deliver them. They wanted green grass and flowing rivers and everything good right now. Right this second. God, I got to have it now. They, 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 they wanted nothing to do with the wilderness and the dry times and the heat. They didn't want any of that when God led them there. Sometimes we feel that, that, that our complaints are justified. Well, my situation's bad. Well, you don't have any idea what she said about me. Hey, if you knew what happened in my past, you'd understand why I'm like this. Is there ever a time that complaining is permissible in God's eyes? If you're pouring it out in prayer and giving it to God, if you're getting it out of your heart and into his hands, sure, sure, that's fine. You can do that. David did that frequently in, 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 in his psalms. He, he poured out his complaint. He, 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 he roared out his anger. David let God hear about his troubles in pretty dramatic language. But by the end of the psalm, he let it go. He'd moved on, and his faith in God was secure. It's when we stay in that mode of discontentment that, 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 that we run into trouble. Think of Job. A man so righteous that God pointed him out to Satan. Hey, have you seen Job? There is nobody like him on earth perfect and upright, who, 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 who respects me and avoids evil. Satan says, okay, we'll see about that. And God lets Satan put Job to the test. And in a single day, Job lost all of his livestock, 
which in those days meant he also lost all of his wealth and all of his children. Shortly after, Satan hit him again and took his health. It was so bad that Job's wife told him to curse God and die. Job didn't do that. Job held on to his faith. Job held on to his integrity. But then his friends showed up. <laughs> friends. His friends showed up, and after seven days of silent mourning, Job finally opened up his mouth and began to complain. Job chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I'll just give a couple samples here. After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man child conceived. We'll skip down a little bit to verse 11. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why didn't I just die? Job's upset. He's venting. It's understandable. He's got to get it out of his heart. It's got to go somewhere. But then his buddies start suggesting that some hidden sin in Job's life has something to do with all these tragedies. And, 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 and Job starts, starts defending himself, talking about how right he is, how he did nothing to deserve this. And he stays in his complaining mode. In chapter 13, he is still voicing his trust in God. He says there, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But throughout his entire debate with his friends, which goes through chapter 37, Job continues to complain. I should have just died. Everything's just terrible. I don't know where God is. God has given me terror. He's given me fear. God, God, God has pushed me down and, 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 and made me like, like, like dust and, and, and ash. He's going on, and he's going on, and he's going on. I did nothing to deserve this, and, 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 and I don't understand why God's doing this to me. He's not content. He's not content. And we might think, considering everything he went through, he's got a reason not to be. He's got a right to complain. We might think that. But then, when the discussion ends, God shows up for the final word. Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 3. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. God is sovereign. He is the only one sitting on the throne, and he answers to nobody. He made Job. And he let all of this happen to Job. And now he's going to, 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 to re remind Job of exactly who he is and why Job should trust him no matter what. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God asks. Who laid out its measurements? Who set the borders of the sea? All through chapter 38, God questions Job. Have the gates of death been opened to you, Job? Do you know where light and darkness dwell? Can you command rain and send lightning? In chapter 39, God asks, God asks Job about nature. Can you, Job, number the months that, that, that the wild goats are pregnant? Will the wild ox serve you? Did you give wings to the peacock and feathers to the ostrich? Did you give the horse his strength? At the beginning of chapter 40, God challenges Job again. You're going to argue with me, Job? You're going to scold me? You're going to, 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 to disapprove of me? Answer. Job decides, uh, no, I've had enough of that. Job decides he's going to humble himself and be quiet. But God is not done. And the questions continue. Will, will you throw out my judgment, God asks? Will you condemn me so you can be righteous? Do you have an arm like me or a voice? Put on your majesty. Show me, you, show me your glory and your beauty. Bring down all the proud ones and humble them. God, God, in, the, God in these verses is, 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 making Job thinking about, uh, is making Job think about his power. 
Now we come to chapter 41, and this chapter has always fascinated me. God, in his line of questioning, spends this entire chapter talking about one creature, Leviathan. I've, I've, I've heard some suggest that this creature is a crocodile or something similar. When you get into the description, friends, this is no crocodile. This is not a crocodile at all. The, 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 the Hebrew word used here is, is Leviathan, meaning serpent, a sea monster or dragon. God had no reason to switch to fiction at this point. Everything that, that he's talked about with Job in, in the previous three chapters has been fact. It's been things that Job can relate to. And considering all, um, and, 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 um, sorry. And considering all of the evidence in the fossil record pointing to, 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 to dinosaurs, I have no trouble imagining that Leviathan is a seagoing dinosaur. So for, for the sake of brevity, let, let me summarize what this thing is like. Nobody is brave enough to mess with it. Nobody wants anything to do with Leviathan. Why? It has terrible, sharp teeth. Its scales are airtight and cannot be pierced. Verses 18 through 21 tell us that by his sneezing, light shines. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goes smoke. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. Once again, this is no crocodile. This is definitely not a crocodile. Is it possible that, that certain dinosaurs might have had the ability to breathe fire? It's something we don't know. It's something I want to ask God about someday. But, but, but once again, God is not telling Job a fictional story. God is talking about Leviathan with the full understanding that Job is going to understand what Leviathan is. Going on, when, 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 uh, when Leviathan raises up, the mighty are afraid. The sword and the spear and the dart can't hurt him. Iron is like straw and brass like rotten wood to him. Leviathan must have had a lot of strength and power. When he swims, the sea boils and a white path shines after him. Picture a giant creature swimming fast enough to leave a wake like that. He is made without fear and he is king over all the children of pride. This is Leviathan. The biggest, scariest, most impossible to deal with thing that God could have described to Job. There's absolutely no hope of surviving something like Leviathan and Job would know that. But now I need to go back to the beginning of, of Job chapter 41 because God asked Job some questions about Leviathan before going into his description. Job chapter 41, verses 1 through 5. God asks Job, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or, 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 or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? We'll stop there. We've heard what Leviathan is. In a word, it's terrifying. And God asks Job, can you pull him out of the water with a hook? Can you play with him like a bird? The unspoken declaration that God is making here is this. I can. I can. In fact, that's been God's declaration throughout all of his questions. I laid the foundations of the earth. I measured it. I set the bounds of the sea and command rain and lightning. I take care of every single animal. I am righteous and mighty and glorious and beautiful. I bring down the proud. I can take the biggest, scariest, most frightening thing you can possibly imagine, Job, and I can play with it like a bird in my hand. Job, I'm bigger than all of it. Now let's circle back. Where did all of this start? Job was righteous. Job suffered. Job began to complain. I asked a question earlier in the message. Is it ever permissible in God's eyes to complain? Is there ever a situation big enough, bad enough, scary enough that we have the right to grumble? 
Are we allowed at that point to have godliness without contentment? The answer, friends, is no. If we live godly lives but give up, but, but, but give up our contentment, we, we miss out on great gain. Job did receive his blessing. After all of this, God actually gave him double what he lost in wealth, livestock, and children. But it came after Job said this. Job chapter 42, verses 1 and 2. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. And that's exactly the point I believe God wanted Job to understand. God is sovereign. In modern English, he can do whatever he wants, however he wants, at any time he chooses to do it. We need to be content and trust him. Our lives are his. We are in his hands. Wherever he leads us, peaks or valleys, we are always in his hands. Whatever comes, even if it's troubling or difficult or scary, trust him. Trust him in the wilderness. Trust him in trials. Trust him in sickness or in want or in difficulty. Trust him when it feels like, 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 like Leviathan is towering over you and staring down at you and is about to tear you up. God's bigger. God is bigger. God is able to play with every situation in your life like a little bird in his hand. He can take care of it like that. Who are we to grumble against him? Who are we to complain about our lot in life? He's with us. He is walking with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. If we will simply be content that, 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 that he is with us and trust him in the journey, he'll take care of all of that. He'll be right there to help us along. We can do all things, endure all things, overcome all things through Christ who strengthens us. Let's stand. I wonder if, 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 uh, if the musicians would come. Discontentment is an easy trap to fall into these days. Everyone gets worried about their rights, their opinions, how, 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 how their lot in life could be better. Friends, we don't need to figure all that out. We have God. We have God. And better yet, God has us. We belong to him. We are his workmanship, and we are right there in the palm of his hands at all times. Sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that. Sometimes, like Israel, we worry about food and drink or all the other mundane things of, of everyday life. We worry about the giants in the land and the conflict that, that we're going to have to face. We worry about the things that God promised to us and wonder how they're ever going to come to us, and we grumble because those things aren't coming on our schedule. Sometimes, like Job, we get hit and it doesn't make any sense to us. We've been faithful. We've done our best to follow God. But we, but we, but we find ourselves not on a mountaintop, but in the deepest, darkest valley we've ever seen. And we wonder if God's walked away. It's easy to be discontented there and complain about our circumstances. No matter what comes, friends, stay faithful to God and trust him. We might not have the food or drink we want, but we still have food and drink. We might not know how to handle the giants in our lives, but we don't have to. God will. We might not know when the promise is coming, but God promised, and that's enough. Let me say that again. God is enough. We might not see him in the middle of our valley, but he has promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. And if we will be content with that, if we will, say, if, if, if we will simply say, okay, God, I'm not on the mountaintop, I'm in the valley, but I've still got you and that's good enough for me. If he'll do that, he'll help us. He'll help us. We, 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 we might have the biggest, 
baddest, ugliest reason not to be content. We might have this big old dragon glaring down at us, but if we just trust God and rest in Him, He'll take care of the rest. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I'm going to open up this altar for anyone who would like to pray. There's a lot of things that go on in our lives sometimes. Sometimes they're big. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they're just like a little sliver that works its way in under our skin. And it can be very easy to be discontent. We can be dissatisfied with the conditions of our life. We can start asking, why me? We can start to ask, where's God? We can start to ask, why did God let this happen? Friends, even if God let it happen, even if something has irritated us, even if something has provoked us, even if hard times have come, God is still there with us. I will say it again and again and again. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Friend, he's right there with you. Whatever your situation, whatever's going on, he is right there with you. Walk with him. Stay faithful to him. Trust him no matter what. God will take care of the rest.